BIP 119, CTV, speedy trial. You may have seen these terms swirling around the world of Bitcoin over the last days and weeks. But what does it all mean and what are the implications for Bitcoin? Today we find out. Let's jump in. Welcome back to another video. My name is Ian Major. I'm an entrepreneur, Bitcoin Pleb, and all around raging capitalist and i'm excited to do this video so we're going to talk today about check template verify a new op code that would represent a new soft fork for bitcoin and so in today's video we're going to talk about what that means and what it would bring to bitcoin but i think equally important that folks are talking about are not just what will be brought to bitcoin in terms of expanded use cases but also how it will be brought and how this could set a precedent for future upgrades so you're not going to want to miss a thing. I think this is super important regardless of where you are on the learning journey. I think understanding these kind of governance related topics as it relates to Bitcoin is super important. For those returning to the channel, welcome back, my friends. As always, it is great to have you. And for those new to the channel, I welcome you as well. I know about 80% of you currently watching are not yet subscribed. So if you like this type of content, I invite you to come along for the journey. I cover all manner of Bitcoin related content, including a whole slew of tutorials and how to's, how to acquire Bitcoin, how to secure it, privacy, best practices, running your own node, Bitcoin mining, and more. And so if any of that sounds interesting, I invite you to come along. But with all that out of the way, let's jump in to the meat for today. All right, so in a nutshell, BIP 119 Bitcoin Improvement Proposal, uh, as the acronym stands for, is a proposed soft fork that would bring a new operation code or op code. So these are just sort of commands or functions that you can think of in the Bitcoin script language. And this new op code, Check Template Verify, or CTV, as you've may be seen would allow for more complex smart contracts in a nutshell. We're gonna talk through some examples in just a moment. This is being spearheaded by Bitcoin developer, Jeremy Rubin. And the way to kind of think about this is, you know, covenants. So think of, you know, full-blown covenants or kind of contracts that can very specifically dictate what can and can't be done with funds, right? You know, there's limitations, not just in terms of, hey, you have to present you know, your keys to verify that you indeed own these funds, but there's also restrictions about kind of what, where, and how those funds can be spent. Now, full-blown kind of covenants, you know, contracts, etc., cetera, uh, introduce perhaps undue risk into the Bitcoin protocol, which has historically taken a very conservative approach to adding new functionality that could otherwise either introduce new attack service or deliver a negative impact to decentralization if it becomes a lot harder for me as an average individual to run a full Bitcoin node. So what Jeremy's trying to do here is kind of introduce a soft fork that would kind of maximize the risk reward trade-off. So it's not kind of full blown, you know, smart contracting functionality, but it's a kind of limited set of new features with minimal downside risk this is, of course, you know, the argument from Jeremy. So the analogy that he uses is around cars. So imagine, you know, having keys to your car. Your car in this case is your funds of Bitcoin. And so if you have your keys, you can open the car uh, and gain access to those funds. And while Bitcoin script today allows for some very kind of basic contracts and sort of rules about where you can then you know spend your funds or where you can then drive there's still a lot to be uh, desired and so what bit 119 and this new op code would bring is the ability to attach additional information to these transactions in such a way as to now you can kind of help guide that the coins or the funds can only be spent in this way. Uh, this even comes with an accompanying smart contract language called Sapio, which is what helps define what are called state machines that help extend the kind of use cases they're in. And on that note, let's talk about the use cases, right? Uh, and make this a little more concrete. One of them is what are called congestion controlled transactions. This is like being able to batch multiple payments into a single transaction. And then at some point later, expand those payments back out perhaps when the mempool or memory pool or you know the network is less congested and backed up. And this is very interesting, right? I mean, of course, for users of the network, you want to minimize fees, you know, minimize transaction fees. And so this could certainly 
uh, help in that regard. There are also some pretty cool implications for lightning. And so things like uh, batched channel creation, so very similar to the congestion control transactions we just discussed, one application of that could be batch creation of lightning channels. And this is really important if you think about like how are we going to get 8 billion people in the world on the Lightning Network. You know, there's some basic math you can do on the back of a napkin that says, okay, well, if each block of the Bitcoin blockchain, right, you know, every, every 10 minutes on average uh, can only fit, you know, this many transactions, even if we dedicated all that block space to new channel openings for Lightning, here's how long it would take to onboard everyone in the world, right? And of course, there's some assumptions there in terms of, you know, non-custodial versus custodial uh, kind of solutions. But the, the result ends up being, you know, quite, uh, quite long. And so this could be a pretty big deal for kind of mass adoption and getting people on the Lightning Network. Uh, there's also some other things around what are called non-interactive channels. Uh, increased channel routing. I won't go into all those details here today, but I will leave you with the very excellent utxos.org website, which is what Jeremy has put together that really lays out, I mean, everything. You know, the uh, it has links to the BIP 119 specification on GitHub, which you can kind of read through the full overview there. Uh, and then it also has, you know, these little zoom ins on different use cases, which are super helpful. Another use case is what he calls smart vaults. This basically allows you to add kind of additional rules that can help govern what happens to, for example, your cold storage under certain situations. So it can add some kind of interesting programmatic logic around security. I think it's important to note that like not everyone in the world is going to take self-custody of their funds, you know, as much as we would like for that to be the case, that is simply not a reasonable expectation. And so you're going to see all sorts of kind of mixed custody models, multi-sig setups where you have a key and maybe a service provider has another key similar to Casa or Unchained Capital today, right? And so this just gives some additional kind of flexibility and optionality to what should happen to funds under different uh, conditions. So somewhat interesting there. And then another one that could be really cool uh, is basically enabling trustless mining pools. So today, you know, if you have a few machines or whatever the case is, you're going to coordinate with a mining pool. And so the pool operator is the one taking in the, uh, the rewards and distributing that or dispersing that out to the uh, miners that have you know participated. There's a lot of checks and balances in, particularly when we think about Stratum V2, which is kind of the latest and greatest you know, mining software, like there's a lot of checks and balances that make it so that pool operators really, one, have not much of an incentive, uh, and two, it would be hard for them to kind of carry out some malicious activity without it being known. Uh, but suffice it to say, it would still be nice to have a kind of fully trustless way of forming, of forming mining pools. And that is basically what this use case would enable, which is pretty cool. I don't know that it helps a huge amount with kind of mining pool decentralization, uh, which some people have kind of rightly, you know, flagged as a potential piece that the community needs to think more about, right? You naturally will have kind of, you know, big pools that converge over time. And so I don't think this moves the needle massively on that, but I think it could help um, by enabling individuals to kind of form these trustless mining pools that can still be somewhat competitive uh, even on a smaller scale. So it would be interesting to see how that played out in reality. And so you may be saying like, Ian, these sound pretty cool. Like what's the what's the downside? Like what's the controversy here? Why are people, you know, certain folks up in arms about this? And it is because of the use of the speedy trial deployment and activation method. Keep in mind that this was used as part of Taproot. I did a whole video on uh, that process, what Taproot brought, what it didn't bring. And so I'd, encu I'd encourage you to check that out as well as it's very much related. But basically what Jeremy has done is created a client of Bitcoin, meaning, you know, like I could run this client on my Bitcoin node. He has created a client of Bitcoin that has CTV, check template, verify, uh, embedded and activated in it. And so what will now happen is the speedy trial process will start signaling on May 5th with a timeout of August 12th. And if the signaling process, well, you know, miners signal their support, et cetera, then the activation height would be slated for 762048, which would approximately be November 9th. So I got to say, I mean, take a look at utxo.org. Um, I think Jeremy has put in a ton of work into not just the specification itself, i.e. the code, but also interacting with the community, 
interviewing different stakeholders, miners, users, node operators, et cetera, et cetera. But it still raises this question of like, well, we just had Taproot that went through the speedy trial process, which was the biggest update uh, certainly since you know 2017 and SegWit. And so a lot of folks in the community are like, do we really need this now? There's a lot with Taproot, like Taproot paved the foundation for a lot of really cool things that haven't even been fully kind of integrated uh, and certainly aren't being used just yet. So that is to say, there's still a lot of work to be done around integrating Taproot, and we're kind of already trying to do this additional soft fork when we just had Taproot go live in uh, last year. So the idea is, does this set a bad precedent? Maybe we already set it with Taproot, but I think it was the case that there was really overwhelming community support for that um, that had been kind of bubbling for quite a long time. Uh, now, to be sure as well, like it's not like BIP 119 has come out of the, the blue. This has been, you know, in the works for some time as well. But it still begs this question of like, are we setting a precedent where future soft fork upgrades uh, can just be kind of rammed through with a speedy trial approach? Now, Jeremy does have some pretty good rebuttals in this piece where he talks about the next steps with BIP 119. I will link this in the description uh, below as well and encourage you to take a look at it. But he's basically citing that some of the folks who have voiced concerns with this, it's not really around like, oh, we found a flaw in the code uh, or a flaw in the proposal, but rather, hey, I just feel like, you know, this is too fast or we need more time or we should consider potential alternative solutions to some of the use cases that you're proposing. And I think he's generally right with that commentary. But as Ryan Gentry points out in this equally excellent post, I would urge you to read this because it goes through very, very interesting, this kind of three-pronged model of Bitcoin governance where you have developers, you have node operators, and then you have miners, right? And each of them kind of has, you know, some checks and balances on the other. And you, you could argue given the history that, you know, maybe nodes have, have sort of the you know, the biggest seat at the table, given what we saw with the block size wars and all that. But, you know, Ryan makes the excellent point that like, look, Bitcoin is already adding immense value to humanity by providing this, you know, leak proof vessel store of value. We've got the Lightning Network kind of well on its way, although there's still a lot to go uh, in terms of Lightning infrastructure and some of the trade-offs. But, you know, his argument is kind of like, look, like we should be we should be more conservative. You know, we should not be adding things to Bitcoin unless there is, you know, massive, massive kind of community consensus around it, unless it's been, you know, massively well vetted. And again, I'm, I definitely don't have the technical chops to assess, you know, the proposal in that way, uh, but I'm merely observing what the community reaction seems to be, even though there is a lot of enthusiasm for those use cases we talked about earlier. And there are others that I encourage you to check out um, there's still some reticence from particularly those in the kind of core developer community uh, that say, look, like, is, you know, like, does this need to happen now? Uh, does this need to happen now? Do we need to drop other things that we're doing in order to review this, right? There's not, it's not just a, should we do it or should we not? It is, should we prioritize doing it now versus other stuff such as, you know, fully integrating Taproot and all that good stuff. So is this good or bad for Bitcoin? I think the use cases are obviously exciting. I think they will add value and there are certainly users and uh, maybe businesses and other entities that would probably use some of this stuff right away. That being said, I would generally fall in the camp that like, what, like we don't need to rush this. You know, we don't, uh, we don't need to kind of jam this through. Despite all the great work that Jeremy has done in building consensus around this idea, I just don't know that it is as urgent that like it has to happen now this year. And so there's a lot of possibilities for how this could play out. If the speedy trial fails and this update is not activated, you know, it would probably try again uh, next year, at which point you will have then had a pretty significant portion of time for the community to really kind of grok this and review and you know weigh up the pros and cons and all that good stuff. You could also potentially have a user activated soft fork that just kind of says we're doing this, right? So there's a lot of interesting ways that this may pan out, uh, but I think it's really, really interesting just to get a better understanding for how this kind of decentralized organism changes over time. I think it's super important just to understand that as a Bitcoin citizen of any stripe and flavor. So with all of that, let's go ahead and conclude today's video.
All right, my friends, there you have it. So we unpacked CTV BIP 119 check template, verify, whatever we want to call it. We took a look at what it promises to bring in terms of some of the, frankly, very compelling use cases around congestion control transactions, uh, you know, batch channel openings for lightning, you know, potentially trustless mining pools. These are very, very cool things. And I think we'll, will and have already garnered a lot of support from the community. That being said, there's, I think, an equally strong consideration of like, look, we just did Taproot. Not even all of that has been implemented yet, um, and there's still kind of a lot to do uh, already there. And so should we really kind of like drop stuff and uh, review, you know, we being kind of developers, the proposal here and really like, does it have to happen now? And so I, again, fall in the camp of probably not, although I think, you know, to try this again through Speedy Trail next year is like probably the, the kind of compromise and middle ground that at least I would like to see as a node operator, but it remains to be seen. I'm curious to hear what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on the pros and cons here? Let me know in the comments down below, but for now we'll go ahead and leave this here. I hope you found this at least thought provoking to think about this kind of governance model. If you found this valuable, you already know what to do. Smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, because I will definitely be covering this and related topics as we go forward. But for now, we'll go ahead and leave this here. As a reminder, every sat counts. And until next time, I'll see you then.